so everyone in the audience knows that in late May, Ruth Pratt became the CFO of Google and now of Alphabet. I think you're probably the most high profile escapee from Wall Street, where you served as the CFO of Morgan Stanley for six years after a long career as a banker. But I think what most people may not know is that you're actually a native Californian, sort of. You were born in England, but you moved here at six and you attended Stanford. So welcome home. Thank you. Great to be here. So after 22 years at Morgan Stanley, how did this happen? Who called whom? So I, I actually go back a long way with Google. Uh, first time I had the opportunity to, to invest was in 1999 through an angel fund. It was unfortunately a very small uh, number of shares, but Morgan Stanley then led the IPO and I'm on the Stanford board, so a lot of overlapping uh, connections. In fact, I was quoting Eric's book back at Morgan Stanley well before I even knew there'd be an opportunity here, and I just think it's a lot of worlds converged. It's great to be here. So this was obviously a big decision. What was your biggest fear, your biggest reservation about doing this, and has it turned out to be true? Well, the most exciting part for me is actually every time I would come out here, uh, it was so clear that there's this extraordinary, infectious culture of innovation, and that was exciting and a magnet. I think the thing that concerned me or that I at least had questions about was I think culture is so important for every organization and what does googly really mean? And um, when, I, when I was finally got, kind of got the words and it was about innovation and speed and decision making and collaboration, my anxiety was relieved. But it was really what is googly? And does it turn out to be that? It does. It does. It's been, uh, it's, it's really, it's infectious. It's, it, it's exciting. So one blog wrote when you came that adult supervision is back at Google. Do you view yourself as an adult? <laughs> well, one of my most fun days actually at um, Google Alphabet was uh, obviously we don't do, we, we have bring your parent to work day. So I brought my 93 year old dad to Google and that was, uh, so that's the adult supervision I live with. <laughs> So after your first earnings call at Google, the shares added about $60 billion in market capitalization the next day. It's the biggest one-day gain in market value for any company ever. How do we all do that? <laughs> when, one thing I always told my clients as a banker, and um, certainly I've always told my CEO, is ignore the stock price and just focus on the long run and things happen. So I'll stick with that advice. So a little more serious, there are a few things, and I think they're all tied together, that have been magic to Wall Street's ears. So let's break them out a little bit. One I think is a little bit ironic, and when I think of Google, I think of accessed information. But historically, the company has not, at least investors have not viewed it as, as giving them access to information. So you've said that Google will be a more transparent company, and you've, you've followed through on it. Why the change? Well, I, I view investors as, um, as, as our partners, as stakeholders in the company and understand they're trying to build financial models. And um, what, I, what I try to focus on in my prior life and here is helping them understand how we think. What are the building blocks that really drive our behavior? And I've not been a believer in point guidance, very consistent with the founder's original view. That's been my view. I think it really limits your flexibility to do what you want. It can actually lead to, um, to behavior that isn't supportive of long-term shareholder value. But I do think that there's an opportunity to create a framework for what are the building blocks that are important so investors understand, and that's what I'm really striving for. Okay. So Alphabet, did you know before you joined? I think if you go back in time, the, um, the vision of the founders has been very clear. This notion, I think it was best captured in the 2013 letter, and Larry repeated it when we announced Alphabet, that incrementalism in technology leads to irrelevance, and you need to continue to push the frontier and, and look for um, for transformative moves. And with that, at a certain point in scale, it really does beg the question of how should you be structured in order to deliver on the opportunity set that you have. So I, I think that if you go back to the early days, you can see the, the seeds of thought and the way they spoke about the business. And what's the process of transforming it from idea to, to reality? The execution. Well, the first part is really the structure around Alphabet. When I, you know, when I describe Alphabet, what I think is so powerful about it is um, the founders wanted to be able to be a magnet for great entrepreneurs, to be an accelerant for great entrepreneurs, and a lot of that is about giving them the autonomy to operate uh, within this this larger 
um, family alphabet. And so what was in, what's been very valuable is creating a structure that allows us, on the one hand, to have maniacal focus within businesses, and at the same time to continue to plant the seeds and really nurture in a, in a smart way those next engines of growth so that we're not dealing with this question about incrementalism leading to irrelevance. And then below that, there's obviously a lot of hard work that goes into, so how do you set, set them up so they can benefit from some of the scale that we have or the infrastructure while enabling them to be independent? But it's really in the governance structure in what is Alphabet. So probably investors' favorite thing that you said was that the company would now practice, and I'm quoting, discipline and expense management. But how do you reconcile that tension between what investors want, high profits, with what the founders and maybe even societies want, which is a desire for moonshots? In the letter Larry wrote, he talked about improving the lives of as many people as we can. He didn't talk about making investors happy. So how do you reconcile those two, those two sometimes competing notions? I don't think high profits necessarily correlates with creating maximum value over the long term. I think what we're really focused on is creating maximum value over the long term. And so the way I talked about it on the second quarter earnings call consistent with the founder's vision is to continue to drive revenue growth. But that's not an excuse, and I think I may have even framed it that, this way, that's not an excuse for not focusing on expenses. And so when I talked about expenses, it was about looking at the rate of growth of expenses, ensuring that we have the same discipline focus on what is your expense base and how does it need to grow to support that revenue growth. You know, I've said in my prior life, you can't cost cut your way to greatness. And so this wasn't about cost, trying to cost cut one's way to, to greatness. It was about ensuring that we have the same very detailed disciplined approach to looking at the growth in expenses, making choices in order to um, optimize while still supporting revenue growth. And it is about revenue growth. We've been clear about that from the earliest days. And how do you make those choices when it comes to the commitment to a new moonshot or to saying one of these ideas, the expenses are becoming out of, out of whack with what this, this idea is ever going to be, with what its, its realization can ever be? How do you make those decisions? Well, my experience as a, as a banker and then as, um, in my prior life as CFO, was very much that there are certain things you can do top down, but the most effective are when you're working closely with the business partners because they have the most nuanced understanding of the business. And so what does that actually mean? If you, in the budgeting process, can create a resource envelope that is tight enough that it drives discussion about how to self-fund businesses, they know what they want to prioritize. And so it's really, again, in, and that is why I stressed in the second quarter call, the importance of, of the budgeting process where you get the discussion with the business partners who actually have the greatest insight into where they want to place those bets where they think they have the greatest opportunity. There have been some com comparisons between Alphabet and um, um, Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. Do you think that's a legitimate comparison? I think there's some elements of what um, Berkshire Hathaway has talked about and what our founders have talked about that are true across many companies, but, but we're focused on long-term value creation. He said that as well. We're focused on backing great leaders. And there are many otherwise differences between the approach, but if you take those as some of the key principles that, um, that Larry and, and Sergey and Eric have articulated for many years, it's about backing great entrepreneurs and, um, and looking at the long-term. Do you, do you think any company, even Alphabet, can have, really have that luxury today of looking at the long term in a world that, where investors are increasingly oriented towards short-term growth and short-term growth in profits? I would certainly hope so, because I think if you're just focused on the short term, again, uh, you might have, by definition, a nice short-term run, but what we're really, I think the investments that have made this country extraordinary have taken time to play out, and I think what is to me so inspiring about Silicon Valley is um, tech innovation, and it is the engine for growth in the economy like no other. I mean, when you, when you look at the data for every um, tech job created, there are five additional jobs created, and that's about thinking about the long term. So um, my experience is there are a lot of investors who appreciate the importance of the long term. They just want to make sure you're making the right choices along the way. 
So backing up, there's been a lot of talk at this conference about the dreaded B word, whether we're in a bubble. You've been right in the thick of the last two, from the first internet bubble, dare I say first, um, to the credit crisis when you helped the government deal with the mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, among many other things. So do you have any bubble spotting techniques you can, you can share? Is, <laughs> is, there, is, there any, is there any way you can know in advance? You know, my, my take from the financial crisis maybe isn't bubble spotting as much as it is, what are the key lessons or kind of how do you fortify yourself so regardless of environment, uh, you, you're in a very strong position. And um, there are quite a number of them, I think, and, and you could see them, I think, also as a banker, that companies don't deal with all of these the same way. Um, one to me that's absolutely imperative is you need to build your infrastructure before you need it. I mean, your financial controls, your metrics, all of the dashboards you need. And the metaphor that we used to use during the crisis is you wouldn't drive a car at 100 miles an hour with mud all over the dashboard. You shouldn't do, this, do that with your company as well. So you need to clear those away. I think that's an absolutely critical one. Uh, I think the, um, uh, the other is you need to focus on what's your greatest source of vulnerability and you need to manage uh, to protect yourself from that. So in the financial crisis, I often said liquidity is your oxygen, and without it, you choke. And that's precisely what happened. Firms did not build in duration, the durability of liquidity, and so when markets went awry, liquidity vanished and they began to choke. I think for any business across any industry, you need to ask yourself, what actually, what is my source of vulnerability? And if you're not doing that and you're just playing right into it, you know, you're, you're one that's gonna have a problem with a bubble. Uh, you know, I, I think the other that's really important, and uh, you know Hank Paulson well, last time we were together, you were interviewing him, uh, I think that he said something to me during the crisis, which I'll never forget, which is, you need to have the will and you need to have the means. And too often, by the time you have the will, you no longer have the means. Now, he was talking about the financial crisis, and when he said it to me, I was thinking of Greece, but I think that's true in any business. It's easy, again, going back to Larry's comment about incrementalism, it's easy to think about incrementalism, but if you don't make the tough choices, that incrementalism can mean that at a certain point you, don't, you no longer have the means. You may have the will, but you no longer have the means. To me, those are really important lessons. And then the last one is experience. I do think that we as a country were really fortunate to have had Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke in the driver's seat because they were able to be nimble and pivot based on their experience. And I think mirroring a lot of the vision and optimism and excellence, engineering talent, with um, experience from some of the other elements is, is important. So those aren't necessarily spotting the bubble ahead of time, but I think hopefully it's ways to make sure that you kind of maneuver through it. Do you see what Silicon Valley's vulnerabilities are, and do you think people here see them? Well, I go back to, uh, to I think, some really clear lessons having been through the 90s, and they, they, the two that I come back to is one, uh, what's your differentiated advantage? Truly, what's your differentiated competitive advantage? And in the 90s, as we all know now, you know, too many companies looked at what they were doing as transformative when I think as we were looking at, at the opportunity to work with them, the reaction was they look like an online catalog. This isn't transformative. So asking again what's truly transformative uh, to me is one of, one of the keys. How are you doing something that is uh, really leapfrog? And the other is, uh, goes back to the financial model. How do you think about it? What are the metrics? How do you envision being able to fund through, uh, through an extended period of time? Yeah. Yeah. So the crisis revealed these, the impermanence of these seemingly fortress-like institutions from AIG to, to Lehman. Did living through that change your worldview in any fundamental way to see large, seemingly impervious companies almost vanish overnight? Uh, the most staggering experience for me was AIG. And the reason was it, the speed with which it collapsed. Uh, if you turn back the clock, there were a series of events and there was the very famous Lehman weekend. And I was down at the New York Fed and went home and uh, got home and got a call from, from someone who said, you need to come back down to the Fed. We need to work on AIG. AIG, this was a Sunday night. AIG will be out of money by Wednesday, out of liquidity by Wednesday, which I thought was an attempt at humor. I, we were all pretty tired then. I'm thinking this is not very funny. 
uh, but it wasn't. It was, it was the reality. And when I went back down there, what became very clear in the middle of the night from Monday going into Tuesday is they wouldn't make it to Wednesday, to through Tuesday, let alone to Wednesday. And what was so staggering about that was how many people in this country would suffer as a result, individuals and small businesses, and never had a chance to see it coming. Um, and that's where I, I came very much to that view. Liquidity is oxygen. If you're a financial institution, you've got to protect against that. And it says the same thing in other industries. We each have to ask ourselves, what is, what's that vulnerability? Because the speed with which it happened, when things unravel, it was uncontrollable. There was no degrees of freedom. There was no ability to pivot or move because there was no time. And you have to buy yourself that time. So you said on your last um, conference call as Morgan Stanley CFO, you said, I think if you look back over the last five years, we, we started out by saying we as an industry needed to change. I think if you look back over the last five years, some made those changes kicking and screaming. I think we are of the view that it was clear where it was going and it was needed and we're proud of the changes we've made. Do you think Wall Street has changed for the better? Do you think our large financial institutions are safer than they were in the pre-crisis days? In the U.S., I think if you look at the level of capital and the approach to liquidity and liquidity management, it's fundamentally different. Uh, I was frustrated along the way, and that's why I said kicking and screaming. I think that when you go through something as profound as that, it has to be a transformational moment for an industry, and change was needed, and regulation was needed. And some may have gotten there kicking and screaming, hoping that there was a way to delay it, but the industry fundamentally recapitalized and the approach to a lot of the activities um, has changed and I, and I felt good about the fact that the industry was on firmer footing as far as I was concerned. So after lots of years as a banker advising companies, you decided in 2009 to become Morgan Stanley's chief financial officer. Why the switch from banking to being a chief financial officer and what is that like to go from being an advisor close to companies but outside them to being on the inside? And well, you just nailed why I did it. It was fun <laughs> having advised clients for so many years where I really felt like I was living their joys and their frustrations. The ability to go inside and have my client be the, the firm I'd worked with for so many years I thought was an extraordinary opportunity. And to work with um, James Gorman as closely as I did our CEO was, was really phenomenal. Um, and that's why I did it. It was, it was really the focus. And, there is a difference when you're principal. I mean, yeah. it stops with you and um, the thousands of people internally who are counting on you, the investors who are counting on you. Uh, but it's a it's a privilege to be able to work with people and kind of go through that process with them. And what did you? What were the biggest lessons for you of going through these this, these years of enormous change on on Wall Street and years of reshaping a business um, in a really fundamental way? Well, it is possible, I mean, whatever, and I guess that's why the optimism out here I love so much. Uh, you know, you need to have clarity of vision. You need to be able to rally the, the team around it. And again, my, one of my lessons I said, you've got to have infrastructure ahead of your requirements. I think that's as true here as it is anywhere. Our companies are growing so rapidly that you, by the time you realize what you need, you're already one or two generations beyond it. And so I think being able to build those uh, may have been late for the financial services industry with all the changes that were needed, but it was really a sense of clarity that comes once you, are, you clear away that mud from the dashboard. I used to often tell my team it's like the proverbial kitchen drawer, you gotta clear it out and you just gotta keep clearing it out. Or you do it once and you, you know, implement systems so you get the operating leverage. And once you do, you feel like it's clear sailing. So uh, it was, that was probably a large part of it. Was your first call with Google's investors, did it feel dramatically different than your calls with Morgan Stanley's investors, or did it feel familiar? Well, my first call with Morgan Stanley's investors was coming out of the financial crisis, so hopefully nobody will be going through experiences <laughs> like that again. But uh, no, it's, it's an ex I think investors understand where we're, where we're taking it, and so it's, it's been a lot of fun. So in simple terms, we think of Wall Street as old establishment, and we think of Silicon Valley as the new establishment. But there's one thing they have in common, which is a problem with diversity and a problem with women. And why is that the case? And are the reasons the same? I would say um, you said a problem with women. It's a problem with too few women. Uh, the, <laughs> Much so, better phrase. Thank you. <laughs> 
wasn't quite sure where that. <laughs> uh, look, I, I think that there is clearly, in my view, uh, an, a, an, a meaningful opportunity to, to increase the percentage of women and other underrepresented groups in senior leadership positions. I've been encouraged by the data that support the thesis that businesses actually perform better when you have diversity of view in your senior leadership position. So this is not just the right thing to do socially, it's the right thing to do for your business. And the toughest part of all is how do you bust through subconscious bias? Uh, what is it that along the way makes it harder for women or other groups to think they have a seat at the table and that it's a level playing field? And I've spoken a lot, I think, about the importance of ensuring, again, that, that the right steps are taken to make it a level playing field, as much as has been written on the importance of leaning in. I think the really important corollary is if you tell someone to lean in and the door's nailed shut, you're just gonna get bruised and battered. And collectively, what we can do, and I think mostly men, um, since they're running most of the organizations, is make sure those doors are open. And what do I mean by that? I think one of the really powerful tools that companies use, um, should use, can use, is uh, effective succession planning. When you come in to pr propose who's next up, you better make sure there's somebody on that list of women underrepresented minority, and if not, why not, and how do we get them up on the list, and make sure the door's open so that subconscious bias doesn't creep in. And in my experience, that conversation, who's on the list, why not, how do we get them there, what's the issue, does start to highlight uh, where subconscious bias creeps in. It's the beauty of transparency, and I think that one of the things that, that Google started a long time ago uh, was putting out data about, so what are the numbers? Let's use transparency to force a conversation and get us to bust through subconscious bias, and then let's have the real conversations because we can't just say it's tone from the top. Tone from the top is critical, but then we need to follow through with things that are concrete. And I'm, I'm optimistic we can do it. I think we have actually more men and women who want to see the change, and that's why I started with the importance of the business case. It's the right thing to do for many reasons. So. I think that we've seen it across industries, and at least in this industry here, and in, in financial service, we're having a real conversation about it. You started on Wall Street in the late 1980s. It was a different time and a hard time, and you obviously managed to bust through those biases at a young age. How do you think you did it? Uh, you know, my mom worked, and I would say that gave me a sense you could be a uh, um, you could be successful professionally and, and have the life that you wanted. Um, I often say that I hate the term work-life balance. I think it's a setup and it's a trap for all of us. I think what you want is a mix in your life that works. It's kind of like a kaleidoscope is really boring if it's like two nice even things of glass. You need to get it to mix and change. So it's about mix. So I think role models are important. I think it's very easy for women and other underrepresented groups to when you're in a senior position to not realize how broad your reach is. And um, you as a role model, women looking to come into the profession, they look at you and they wanna be you. And I think that's, so starting with role models. And I just think there was, um, my view was this is what I wanted. And um, I had some great sponsors along the way who took risks on me. And you need to make sure you have somebody who's in, the, who's in that position and does. And um, I'm kind of stubborn, I guess, and just didn't give up, so. I was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> In the past, you've talked a little bit about the difference between sponsors and mentors, which I think is a really interesting way to think about things. Will you elaborate on that a bit? I think a sponsor is someone who will take risk on you and has the power to put you in a position or the authority to put you in a position um, that, that is, that's the door opener. A mentor can give you advice but isn't the one who's actually there to say, oh, you know what, this might be a risk, but I'm gonna take a risk on you, and is there and will back you up, and is there when you say, I don't actually think that one makes sense for me, they'll be honest and candid with you about, you know what, you might be, that, you're right or you're wrong, and to me, the lucky breaks were people who took a risk on me, and they were all men, because there weren't senior women around when I was rising up through the ranks, so I don't think the sponsor needs to look like you, they need to be somebody who wants to take a risk on you, and I do think it's our obligation to then make sure we're sponsoring the next generation. 
So we're probably going to open it up to questions in a little bit, but I wanted to ask while we're on the way to while we're on the way to questions, what is the biggest economic issue out there that Silicon Valley isn't thinking about? The one I'm really concerned about, and I'm glad you asked this, is, is student lending and the federal student lending program. And it actually goes to an area you know extremely well, which um, to me, having worked on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the housing crisis, what was, what was clear was that that was a well-intentioned social program, home ownership in the United States in the 60s, a well-intentioned social program that due to its design and execution, really took us as a country down the wrong path. And I think student lending has too many similarities to that program. Well-intentioned. Who could argue that education isn't a passport to social and economic mobility? But the, the execution and the design and execution of the program, I think, again, is hurting those it's intended to help and leaving taxpayers holding the money. There's now a trillion three in student loans outstanding. And what's most concerning is watching the, um, the repayment rate, the default rate. So 68% of kids who go to for-profit colleges are not graduating in six years. So they're left with their loans. They don't have the, um, the degree that's the passport to social mobility. And what's even worse with the student lending program is you can't extinguish that debt in bankruptcy. There's a presumption that we, the government can garnish social security and wages. And so we're creating this growing social and economic problem. Again, hurting those designed to help. And to me, having watched the first movie, which was so painful, seeing this second iteration of it, I think is something that we need to keep on the agenda. So if anybody has questions, please uh, line up at the, at, the, at the speakers. Is there a fix? Um, is, there a, is there a fix from Silicon Valley? Is there a Washington fix for this? Fortunately, it's moved up on the agenda, and there, there's no silver bullet for something that's grown to this scale. I think, again, transparency has been important. The scorecards that have been created that actually provide families with greater visibility on what, what's going on in institutions is a starting point. And I also think at the core, what are we trying to solve? We're trying to give kids a useful education. And so can technology play a critical role in that? Absolutely, it can at all levels. I thought Mark's comments earlier today on, on virtual reality were fantastic. At Google, one of the areas we're really excited about is what we're doing in VR, our work with cardboard and going into the schools. And this is not at the college level, at the, at the young level, enabling kids to leave their, their home turf and travel the world through VR and understand what's gone on in history and what's going on around the world. So from the youngest ages to the oldest ages, can technology play a role, of course? So please go ahead. Hi. Um, my question is very specific to whether or not you believe the Valley is properly capitalized given the transformation that technology is having on the economy. Is it under or over capitalized? Because we have arguments going both ways in terms of the venture investments and also investments in larger corporations. I think um, yesterday we heard from the Disney CEO that a trillion dollars worth of capital has been transferred from public companies to the private sector. And the question, I guess, in my mind is, are we actually undercapitalized despite the huge cash infusions on the, on the uh, startup world? It's a fascinating question because capitalization in this context, I think, is, is, a, is um, different than the world I came from in finance. What I find so transformative and inspiring about technology is, is uh, that we're addressing really meaningful problems, addressing problems of scale that can make a difference to so many people's lives. And you know, if you look, for example, at what we're doing with driverless cars, I mean, the opportunity to reimagine what are cities, the efficiency that you can get, why are we taking so much space for parking garages? Uh, you know, and when you look at a resource-constrained environment, why are we not using these resources more efficiently. And you can go area after area. And so the ability to put capital behind these ideas that can transform the lives of so many people, I would say, is an appropriate allocation of resources. Within that, are we putting too much to work in, in certain areas, um, certain private companies? You know, yeah, so well, but it goes back to what's the most important What's the most important lesson that we've learned time and time again? Selectivity is absolutely key. 
Um, you know, Mary Meeker had some great data in her internet report that if you looked, I think it was from 1980 to 2002, there were over 1,700 IPOs. 2% of them created 100% of the, of the value. And so is there some misallocation? It, it, inevitably there, there is, but it comes back to selectivity is key, and I think putting capital behind uh, um, opportunities that are gonna have the kind of impact that these have is, is the place you wanna be. Thank you. Uh, hi, Stephen Levy, uh, great discussion. So I'm curious, in the discussions you had leading up to Alphabet, whether there wasn't a counter argument that at Google, the whole is more than the parts in terms of the freedom of engineers to move from one place to another, and the idea that all these companies benefit from the infrastructure. Um, what I hear now in theory, I guess the CEO can say, hey, Amazon Web Services can, can do a better job than the Google infrastructure there. I don't know if the CEOs would be free to do that. Uh, could you talk about you know, how much you worried about the idea of a siloization and drawing away from the idea of splitting out uh, Google from the other companies? So the, the question of, um, of talent and mobility and the ability to, to really find your way um, is always important. But I would say that mobility, uh, and the way I've always looked at it in my career, is you're always running the risk if you don't create a really thriving, exciting, innovative environment that you're going to lose the best talent in any event, whether it's to another alphabet company or outside of one's own company. And so did, have we, did we consider what are, what are the pros, what are the cons? Uh, I believe that we, we did, but I think the main point was we want to create the opportunity to attract the best talent to each one of these companies so that they can have the opportunity to innovate at scale in a way that they couldn't otherwise, and it's an extraordinary um, platform on which you rest. And within each one of them, you know, one of the key things for Sundar, uh, runs, uh, who runs Google, as, as I'm sure you all know, uh, is looking at the framework that the founders have talked about for many years, 70, 20, 10, 70% 70 of the resources on the core, 20% adjacent, 10% moonshots, big bets, and that's true within Google. A lot of what we're doing, the 70-20-10 framework and innovation within Google is as key to for the Alphabet family as a whole, and so there is mobility uh, within and as part of the overall Alphabet family, we've clearly spent time focusing on how we can be as effective as possible while still sticking to that core principle of as much autonomy as makes sense, but the CEOs across the businesses, clearly that is one of the areas that we've spent time on. Our view is those types of issues can be dealt with, but what can't is creating a structure where you have as much autonomy as possible so one can be as nimble and as focused as possible. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, could you comment on your feelings about practices like um, earnings uh, estimates quarterly, uh, share buybacks, options, et cetera? Well, I tried to hit my, my comment on um, quarterly earnings and guidance. So, look, I think that creating value for the long term is uh, medium to long, however you want to frame it, is where we deliver the most value for stakeholders. And I think there's a risk, short-termism can be a real risk to creating long-term value. And it may, you know, it, and, um, and that's why I made the comment about uh, earnings guidance. I think there's a risk that that may, at certain points in a company's journey, have them sub-optimize for the medium to long run because they're trying to solve for something short-term. I think short-termism is, uh, is a real risk across every industry. But can and you stop giving guidance? That's, you know, I beg your pardon? Can you stop giving guidance? I mean, what are, how are you limited? Can one stop giving guidance? Yeah. Um, I'd rather not start, but <laughs> the, uh, the, I think, again, the, way, the difference I was trying to convey is point guidance makes it a whole lot easier for someone to build a model and say, okay, you're going to hit to this number. But what's really the question is, how does one think about running their business? What, what are the building blocks so that there's a predictability about the way we're, we're operating? And what are the core governing principles? And I think that type of if you want to call it guidance, I would say that falls into the umbrella of guidance, is helpful. How one transitions from, from point to something else. If the view is that in the, it is in the long-term best interest 
for our investors to be looking at this, to give you the framework, but the point guidance has constrained our ability to respond because we live in an uncertain world. You're doing the right thing for your investors, and we do live in an uncertain world. I think we have time for one more question. So thank you very much for your very candid and open discussion about diversity in the tech world. And so my question to you is, um, what has Google done very personally to implement policies around racial diversity and other diversity amongst under, uh, underrepresented groups? And also, what policies have they enacted so when those folks get into Google, it's not a hostile environment? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, my first week, I was delighted because one of the first things that I was asked to kind of that filled up onto my calendar was with our senior diversity team. And that, to me, was a statement about how important this is on the agenda. And it starts with tone from the top and leadership and then all that's being done um, specifically to address your question. And we have a whole series of programs. The view is this is a problem that's existed in society for a long time, so there is no silver bullet. So whether it's work on subconscious bias, whether it's work on affinity groups so that you don't feel you're the only one, which I think is a problem for women, feeling I'm the only one who's dealing with this issue. Uh, but we've also dealt with things like let's go to the college level and provide support where we have role models at the college level that tell underrepresented minorities, you know what, there's a place for you in engineering. And let's make sure we're not just dealing with it once you get here, but doing what we can and putting money behind it to make sure that we're actually increasing the pipeline and trying to change the trajectory here. And let's put data out there so people can see what are our numbers. They're getting better, they're not where we want them to be. And so again, our leadership team has done a lot that across a spectrum to try and make a difference with a firm co commitment from the senior team that we'd like to see ongoing improvements in diversity. So thank you for asking that. Thank you so much. Thank you all.